So welcome everybody to another edition of Ozark's Voices, an oral history project of the Missouri State University Libraries. Today's date is Monday, September 20th, 2021. Our special guest this evening is Mona Decker. Mona, thanks for coming. We're in her car at McClure during the jam session. And during this time of COVID, it is outdoors. And so if you hear music in the background, it's the jam session at McClure. Thanks for coming down. <laughs> well, let's go with it. All right. So let's start with a really difficult question. Where were you born? Notting Hill, Missouri in Ozark County. All right. And did you grow up there as well? I lived there until I was barely 13 years old when my dad and mom bought a business in Ava and we moved up there. So you moved to Ava when you were 13? Barely 13. Uh-huh. So that would have been what they used to call junior high school? No. Uh, well, yes, junior high school. You didn't have such a thing then. It was just grade school and high school. Just went from grade school. And I graduated that. from the eighth grade there and then on, went on to high school oh, there. Okay. So it was a big, it was, oh, so you went to eighth grade in Ava. Yes. And then went on to high school. Yes. Spent your entire high school yes. career in Ava? I've, I've spent most of my life there. Uh-huh. And you still live in Ava? Yes. In Ava proper? Yes. Okay. Uh, and where did you meet your late husband, Max? Oh, I met him for the first time, I think, at what I called SMS. Uh-huh. You were and both students there? He came there one term. Uh-huh. And uh, I uh, met him at the Ozark County picnic that they had in, I believe it was Phelps Grove Park. Uh-huh. And uh, I had a geography class under Merle Luna, who was the superintendent of Gainesville, but you know they called in people uh -huh. from the surrounding right. area to right. uh, teach a class. And I had uh, Merle's class, and he later was my superintendent <laughs> at the first high school I taught. <laughs> and uh, there I met uh, a boy that turned out to be one of Max's best friends. Mm -hmm. And Max was across the hall in another geography class. I wish I could remember that woman's name. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember later on, uh, she taught out of the same book that one of my professors, Peabody, <laughs> wrote. I found that out much later. But at any rate, Jim wanted me to go on a blind date with his mm -hmm. uh, girlfriend. And I informed that young man I wasn't about to go on a date, blind date, even if I would like to be with he and Ruby. Uh -huh. Tell you the truth Ruby about was, it. Ruby was his girlfriend. Uh huh, I yeah. think fiance. Yeah. And uh, tell you the truth about it. There was a big, tall guy I saw Jim talking to frequently, and I figured it was that one. So <laughs> I told him no, in no uncertain terms. Well, later that, I don't know how much time passed, but my aunt was going to school up there at the time, one of these teachers, you know, that taught and went to school mm -hmm. during the summer terms. Yeah, advanced there, yeah. And she wanted me to go to the Ozark County picnic. I declined. And she <laughs> said, I said, now, and Edith, I live in Douglas County. She said, you were born in Ozark County and you're eligible to go and I don't want to go by myself. So loving my aunt, I went. And there I met, I thought, one of the most handsome guys you ever looked at. Mm -hmm. And I spent most 
most of the time down there talking to him, and it happened to be Max Decker. Mm -hmm. Well? And that wasn't the guy that you... Oh, told. it wasn't the one I oh. thought it was at yeah. all. I might have changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, oh, I don't know how long later it was, but uh, they offered me a job in the Gainesville High School. And I hadn't finished college at that time, but you know, you could go in on a special certificate. And our state supervisor at Ava knew that I wanted to go into the high school. I was teaching in elementary. Mm -hmm. And so he suggested that I go down there. Mm -hmm. And I did. And Merle Luna, interviewed me. I may be going into too much no, detail No, this is great. Here, this is great. But uh, the superintendent interviewed me, and I can remember he said, now, Mona, we do things a little differently down here than they do at Ava. <laughs> and he said, I want you to go around to all of the board members and tell them you want the job down here. Go to their homes? Go, just go find them. Yeah. and uh, talk to them and tell them you've applied. And he came right out and said, I want you, but I want you to go and talk to the board members. Uh -huh. Well, that constituted a little bit of a problem, but, uh, and I thought, hmm, we don't do that at Ava. We had board members that had been there for heaven only knows how many years, and at that time there wasn't any controversy. And I went to uh, a couple of them, and uh, it happened that my uncle was on the school board. And it also happened that my mother's first cousin was on the school board. <laughs> Now, her first cousin was more like a brother because her mother died early and she was always at Aunt Alice's house. I got tired of that. And being the independent young girl I was, I got back to the car and I told my mother, now, I am not doing this. I've got a job. I don't have to have this. I'm not going to do it. And I proceeded to get the car and go back to Ava. Hmm. You, you've known me long enough to know I'm independent. <laughs> well, that meant every single board member had to vote for me. Mm. And uh, when it came to my uncle Horace, Merle said, "Now I can't. I know Horace you can't vote for, her, but can you tell us anything about this girl?" <laughs> Well, they had run an ex-Marine off the previous year, <laughs> and they said Uncle Horace just kind of leaned forward in his seat and said, well, I'll tell you one thing for darn sure, you won't run her off. <laughs> I got the job. <laughs> now, that's a long way around to where I met Max. And they didn't run you off. They didn't run me off. No. Even though I had in the top 40s and two freshman classes, 52 in a class. Hmm. Needless to say, I've spent most of my time grading papers. Yeah. But uh, we had a place in Ava where the rural schools came in and bought their books. I don't know how familiar you are with the old rural schools or not, hmm. but at the start of the rural schools, you had to come in with a list of books and bring them in and get mm -hmm. your texts, all mm -hmm. that stuff. Mm -hmm. And they had a soda fountain there, as well as the bookstore. Mm -hmm. And I would go in every day after the uh, school and have coffee or something. I loafed there, mm -hmm. and Max came in. Well, he had... This was after the picnic conversation. Oh, yes. It felt school And by fun. that time, I was dating somebody else. Oh. And... Uh, <laughs> going home on the weekends. And since we had not had any contact, this came before the Gainesville episode, but he had written me a note and asked me for a date. 
Well, I just dismissed it in my mind, and I thought that's the silliest thing I ever heard of a guy riding a girl to ask her for a date. <laughs> so I didn't do anything about it. I didn't reply. <laughs> and uh, That's not the way it was done in Ava. Huh? Uh, well, it's not the way Mona Decker did look at <laughs> it. Let's say it that way. And uh, then I met him at the bookstore one day, and we had coffee together, and he asked me for a date again. And uh, I said, no, I'm going home to Bible study. And I went home. Mm. I think he asked me maybe about three times. I forgot, my gosh, that's 65 years ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, but he was persistent. Yes. He laughed and told me later that that third time, if I'd have turned him down, <laughs> but uh, that he wouldn't have been around. Yeah. But uh, the time that I told him I was going home on Wednesday night to go to Bible study, I kind of had second thoughts, and I finally said, ask me some other time. I hmm. might go. Mm -hmm. Well, I was living with my sister during the week and going home on the weekends. Mm -hmm. My sister was a teacher, and uh, that one mm -hmm. moved to Kansas City. Mm -hmm. She has a right up in the Ozark County Times at 99. Mm. And uh, her sheriff... Uh, her husband was sheriff of Ozark County, mm. and I lived with them, and uh, we had a date to go to West Plains and uh, go to dinner and a movie. It came such a rainstorm, you cannot imagine. I felt sorry for the guy. You could hardly <laughs> see the road. And we got to West Plains, and I just suggested let's do this another time, let's go home. Mm -hmm. And we did. Mm -hmm. But, now this I probably shouldn't tell because it gets into politics. Mm -hmm. But it also kind of shows you how independent and ornery I am. <laughs> so we got in the car and uh, I said, before I go with you, I want to ask you a question. Max looked at me kind of funny. <laughs> and I said, before I go with you, I need to know, are you a Democrat or a Republican? <laughs> you can imagine the shock on his face. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, I'm a Republican and a rather strong one in that. I said, that's okay, my dad doesn't want to go with Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> so he passed Which, that test, and huh? <laughs> I, uh, while it might have been true, uh, I probably was being really ornery. Well, that's the story about how the Deckers met. All right, so... And believe it or not, this sounds... This absolutely sounds unbelievable. But Tom, I knew that boy was the one for me on that first date. Mm. And I'd been dating another guy for two years. Mm. And, uh, but I don't know, there was just something about Max mm. that you just I knew. knew. Mm. And heaven only knows, there was no mistake about that because we had... 65 wonderful years, mm. and I never taught a day in my life after Max and I were married that we weren't in the same high school and even in the same building. Mm. And uh, I laughed and said, for 27 years, he was my boss. <laughs> and then, <laughs> knowing me, <laughs> I would hurriedly say, at school. <laughs> now, During the school day. Now, don't you wish you hadn't asked me all these questions? Uh, so, you, you can delete anything uh, no, you want No, this to. is good. So, how long did you date before you got married? Well, I think we started dating 
I don't remember dates or anything, but I think in April uh -huh. is when we started really. Uh, he came into Gainesville to high school the year after I did, mm. and we started dating uh, steadily when he came to Gainesville. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he was teaching as well. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we uh, had planned the wedding for the summer of '54. And uh, the Korean War had broken out, you know. And uh, the draft co uh, the draft board would call him up for induction. Mm. And then they'd send him home. I don't know how many schools Max retired from mm. while they were in the process of drafting him. Mm -hmm. And uh, Max has a damaged, I still talk like he's still here with me. Mm. Uh, Max had a damaged mitral valve, mm. and when they'd get up and examine him in Kansas City, then they'd send him home. Mm -hmm. And uh, it looked like he was about to be called up again, and so we decided to go ahead and get married before he went into service, and that's what we did. We mm -hmm. married in uh, December of 54. 54. Mm -hmm. And oh, I remember when he went we were living in Ava then in one of Daddy's apartments and uh, driving back and forth to Gainesville. Mm -hmm. And they called him up. We were just certain he'd have to go in. And they told them uh, up at that place that they'd have six weeks of basic training and be shipped to the first front lines in mm -hmm. Korea. Mm -hmm. And Oh, I was devastated. Mm. Uh, anybody Korea that's and, even lived mm, through mm. the war years know right. what devastation that is. And uh, Mother wanted me to stay at the house the night he was gone, and I wanted to go back over to ours. And while I'm not a big crier, I did a lot of crying that night. Mm -hmm. And the next day, I got a very important phone call, and it was Max, and he said, meet me at the trailway, trailway station in Springfield. I'm on my way home. Mm. And that was the last time they ever called him up, but mm. my goodness, uh, mm. one throat infection or anything like that could kill him. Yeah. And he certainly couldn't have survived Korea. Yeah. And so I was proud that he got to come home. What a what a uh, anxious time! Oh, it was horrible, yeah. but it turned out all right. Yeah. And uh, but people, as you know, that haven't lived through the war years, have no idea, and even I don't have any idea how horrible it is. But there were really bad times. Yeah. Yeah. But. You know, looking back over everything, uh, I've heard Max say so much at the time. He, he'd say, you know, Mona, we've, we've really lived through the best of times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it and think about how the world has changed, how our culture has changed, mm -hmm. and then think back, I remember, I think maybe and I don't trust my memory all that much, but I believe it was Dan Rather, back in the time that he was so popular, mm -hmm. that he wrote a book, and I remember reading, and I think I have the author correct. I can remember one particular thing about it so much. He talked about the lighting of the Christmas tree in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you've read it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they wouldn't let the people in with their packages on the lawn, but they would let them come in without being checked or anything, come in mm -hmm. and witness the Christmas tree lighting. Mm -hmm. And so he made the comment that what they did, where they had been out Christmas shopping, and had all kinds of packages, they just simply put them on the outside of the fence went in, mm -hmm. came back out, 
Christmas packages were packages. still there, mm -hmm. and they walked off with them. Uh -huh. Now compare that to our today yeah. penitentiary-style fences that yeah. are up everywhere yeah. and yeah. all that's going on. Now that's a different type of culture. Definitely a different and we, time. And we lived through the Eisenhower years, mm. and I can see why Max said we've lived in the best of times. And I don't want to be one of these old ladies that are saying, you know, the past is all so much better than everything else. Every era has its highs and lows. Mm -hmm. But uh, I can't keep from remembering that when I think about those years that truly were some of the best of times for America. Yeah. What about the Cold War? How did, how did you experience that? Did you feel like, you know, well, of course, there was con uh, yeah. constant tension about it. You never knew what was going to happen. Yeah. And it, it, I can remember times when uh, the threat of the nuclear war was heavy. And I can also remember having a little toddler when uh, it looked like we were going to have the Russians put missiles in Cuba. Right. And uh, that was a really difficult period because you could think ahead. Now, if this all happens, how do I protect a little girl? Right. And you know, Dad, my dad was a good friend of Durard Hall that was uh, in the legislature at that time, mm -hmm. and I know he talked to uh, Mr. Hall later on, and it turns out from what Mr. Hall said that we were much, much closer to war than we even realized when we were just listening to the news on mm -hmm. TV. Mm -hmm. and. I can remember wondering whether they were going to turn back as Kennedy insisted they mm -hmm. do. So that was a rather tense time. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe I'm jumping ahead, but uh, then Max went on to work on his doctorate in Nashville, correct? He did his specialist in Nashville, okay. and because of the convenience of it, uh, we uh, decided he'd probably stay up here closer, and uh, he toyed with the idea of going out to uh, Oklahoma, uh, Stillwater, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and we made the trip out there. Mm -hmm. and. Something happened that was a little unusual because you usually have to apply and they have to investigate, go through all that rigmarole. <laughs> and he happened, the man that interviewed him happened to have gone to Peabody. Hmm. And uh, he met Max and they accepted him the day we were out there. Hmm. But we got home and we started to of course, we had that young child, and money wasn't plentiful, and we'd spent a lot on out-of-state tuition. <laughs> and uh, so he started thinking about the University of Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And we went down there, I forget for how many summers, mm -hmm. but uh, Becky and I tried to make it like a vacation for her, and we all enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And so. He uh, went to the University of Arkansas, mm -hmm. and it felt like a God thing the way things worked out. Mm -hmm. He had everything pretty much in line except that necessary residence. Mm -hmm. And that particular year, they waived that and allowed you to take a summer term or so. Mm -hmm. and satisfy that. that would suffice. So he went that year and uh, he had thought maybe his friend at Seymour was going to go down that year and they could 
room together, and they couldn't. And then one of his friends that worked, I believe, at the Burroughs Center in Springfield mm -hmm. contacted Max mm -hmm. and said, I think, Max, that I'm going to go down. Maybe we could room together. Mm -hmm. So that worked out. We only had one car, and uh, I thought, well, we're going to have to buy another car. My dad had died, and Mother said, Mona, your dad's car is sitting out there, and you know I don't drive it, but she kept it, so, you know, she'd have someone if she needed to mm -hmm. have someone drive for her. Mm -hmm. So I had Daddy's car, and uh, that worked out. And then a couple of wonderful professors down at the University of Arkansas, uh, Morris's uh, professor said, now I know you are working, and I will do your work. It was sort of a makeup situation, or he taught him beforehand, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. And he said, you can go back to Springfield and work. Mm. on Friday. Mm. When Max's professor heard about it, he said, well, if he's doing that for you, uh, if he's doing that for Morris, I'll just do yours that way. <laughs> and uh, Max got to come home on Friday. Mm -hmm. And uh, then do you know that it worked out that with our holidays he could be at school? And even with graduation and all of the main events where they needed the regular principal there, he could be there. Mm -hmm. We didn't go in debt a single penny mm. for him to get that doctorate. Mm. Everything worked out, and then the very next year they changed that residency <laughs> thing. <laughs> Do you see what I mean about the hand of God? Yeah. So he got his doctorate at the University of Arkansas. Yes. By the way, Bill Clinton was down there studying law about that time, no. but we didn't know him. Never ran into him. <laughs> that was about the same time. Yeah. Um, so then he went to get a specialist degree? The specialist degree was done before the doctorate. Oh, okay. We both went to Peabody and did our master's. Okay. He did his master's in... Uh, Mm, let's see. He did his master's in uh, school administration, I think. Hope I don't have this turned around. He did the specialist in English hmm. and then the doctorate in administration. Mm -hmm. But uh, he loved it down at the University of Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Good school. Uh, but uh, I really. We really love Peabody of Vanderbilt. It's, you know, a part of Vanderbilt now. Right, it's right. just the school of ed, but uh, I loved it down there. So you told me a story a while back that when you were in Nashville at Peabody. <laughs> that must be the Brenda. <laughs> you lived in an apartment complex. Yes, on the, 21st Avenue. Yeah, and what was the name of the apartment complex? Uh, I don't know, it was a privately owned thing. It was okay. a beautiful uh, brick building that had a courtyard right in the center. It right. kind of went around About the two court stories? Row. Was it two yes, stories? Yes, I, okay. I think that's all. Gosh, that's been a long time ago. So that would have been what? Oh, early it would have been in the early 50s. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we married in 54. And we went to Peabody. I think we graduated down there in '57, uh, probably. I'm not sure of the dates, okay. but uh, that's the one where the little singer. She was yeah, was very little... young then. Brenda Lee. Brenda Lee had an apartment right across on the second floor, directly across from the ours. Court, the courtyard. Across the courtyard. And they practiced late at night. And now there was no air conditioning in those right. apartments. You right. had to have the windows open. And every night, about the time you wanted to go to sleep, they started practicing. <laughs> now, I couldn't hear her voice, but the musicians were loud, loud, loud. <laughs> 
57, so she would have been, that's when she, her career really started to take off. I guess. Yeah. But I have never, and I, I guess it's kind of mean, but I've never been a fan of friendly <laughs> ladies. Ever since as, those... as much as I've learned to love country music. <laughs> But it was that early experience in the, and, and the I apartment think, complex. And I that, think I told you the story of going down to the shopping center in that area and uh, going in, I think it was an Otasco store, and told them I wanted to win the fan. <laughs> and this man was such a nice salesman, southern gentleman. <laughs> so he was going around pointing out the ones that were the quietest. And I think much to his shock, I said, I do not want those. I want the loudest one you got. <laughs> and I bought it, and I came home, and I put it in one of those double windows, <laughs> and I turned it up full force, <laughs> and I started getting to sleep. <laughs> yeah, so they, you had your own white noise machine going there. <laughs> Oh, I, I hadn't thought of that since you <laughs> were the one I told it to a long time ago. You never had any kind of a confrontation with Brenda, did you? Oh, no, her? I uh, never did meet her. Yeah. I didn't want to. But you kind of knew that she was, you know, she was a singer. And, oh, yes. And, I, I, yeah. We knew who she was, but and I they, didn't care. Uh, I just you know, wanted sleep. They, uh, most of those singers keep late hours. I don't know where her folks were. <laughs> I never did see any of them. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, as I said, I've never cared anything about listening to her. <laughs> Even though I didn't hear her, I just heard the music. Just the musicians, <laughs> huh? What's the next question? Well, so then after that, so... Um, you two were able to work together pretty much your entire career. We did. Yeah. Uh, now let me ask you. It used to be, at least I grew up in Iowa, but I heard it's all the way down here that when a woman got married, she was not supposed to teach. Oh, that was before my time. Okay. I'm old, but I'm, I'm not that I'm old. Not that old. <laughs> it used to be that way. I wrote an article for uh, my friend that used to be Barbara Cook that uh, owned the Ozark Mountaineer for a while. And, uh, oh, I'd written it about a neighbor of ours, and I'd written a story for uh, a magazine writing course I had up at SMS. And Max got a hold of that thing one time. With I'd put it away somewhere, and he got a hold of that, and he pestered me to death <laughs> for me to look it over, revise it a little bit, and send it in to the Ozark Mountaineer, and finally to shut him up, I did it. <laughs> well, Barbara, I've forgotten what her last name was. Is it where? I don't recall. But at any rate, I'd had her in high school at Gainesville. And she accepted that thing. And then later on, she read, uh, she had uh, written s some little articles about the fact she'd gone to school to me, and she put in this thing about teachers that got married weren't supposed to be teaching. Well, I've heard about that, but as I said, it came before my time. Yeah. I think my mom had to stop when she started having my, my brother. Is that right? Yeah. I suppose it might she's matter. She's 94 now. Well, so. I'm not too many years behind her at hitting that 90 mark. Um, but I don't know that for a fact, but I think she, maybe she just elected to stop. I don't know. Now, I remember uh, a good friend of mine taught history down at the University of Arkansas. And her daughter Carol and my Becky would swim together, and we got to be pretty good friends. And I know she was laughing one day and saying that 
uh, women didn't use, uh, at the University of Arkansas didn't have children and become full professors. Mm. But she had uh, her child, uh, I think, in her 40s. Mm. And, uh, oh, she was a lovely little girl. But she got to retain her full professorship. Mm -hmm. Might have been my mom retired when she started having children. Retired from teaching. But uh, jobs have changed a lot. I can remember when women didn't get paid as much as men did, which was not a good thing. Yeah. Still a problem today. Yes. But, you know, there's a lot of things. Now, this is just Mona philosophy. <laughs> but for the work and all that, equal pay is the fair thing. But I'm still of the old school enough to think there's certain jobs men are better with than women. And there's a now if I'm getting on, you may not like this with the political stuff. But now take for instance, secretaries of state. Mm -hmm. uh, with so many countries in the world looking down on women, mm -hmm. it makes more sense to have a man in that job to as me. A, as a Secretary of State. I yeah. think you have to look at the culture. I, I think you have to look at the physical uh, capabilities. Mm -hmm. And it's, to me, it's stupid to put me, uh, women in jobs that men are better fitted for. Mm -hmm. Now, you probably didn't bargain for me giving my <laughs> political philosophies. <laughs> so I'll shut up on that and let you ask me Okay, question. next question. <laughs> um, you've often mentioned uh, you seem to really enjoy your students. Oh, yes. And you're almost like, I don't know, proud that some of them went on to do pretty amazing things. Of course. Yeah. That gives you a feeling that you've contributed something. Yeah. And if you can't, now, goodness only knows around Ava, I was known to be a very strict teacher, mm -hmm. but I did not entire, and I did not intend for any child to fail unless I had tried to get the very best out of them. Mm -hmm. And I didn't intend to put up with bad behavior, and mm -hmm. I didn't. Mm -hmm. I think in uh, all my years of teaching, I taught probably 30 in the high school and about five more in grade school, rural schools, two in a rural school. Mm -hmm. And I think I could safely count on one hand the number of times I've ever sent a student to a principal. Mm -hmm. I think it's a necessity to handle your own problems. I got sent to the principal's office once. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> now, this life is going to be horrible on that tape. <laughs> I got sent for allegedly picking on my little brother. Uh-oh. That's cool. <laughs> I don't remember what Fern Hayes, the principal, said to me, but... I think I got the message that I need to leave my little brother alone, <laughs> at least while I was at school. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> uh, Becky Ann, my daughter, often says that uh, that kids would rest, rather face her daddy in the office as her mama. <laughs> <laughs> but I did take care of my own problems <laughs> at the best. But... I firmly believe that you had to try hard, you had to be fair, 
above all things, you needed to be fair. Uh -huh. And you had to expect a little more out of them than they thought they could give. Mm -hmm. And you actually challenge learned. Them, challenge them a little bit. You uh, actually learn from some of them if you'll get out of the way and listen. Hmm. But uh, I laugh now. Uh, some of the kids that might have detested me the most are among the first to run and help me with the door or look out for me. Yeah. I'm always saying Hillary Clinton wrote that book about it takes a village to rear a child. <laughs> now I laugh and say it's taking all Ava to take care of Mona. <laughs> but they are all so good to me. They all take care of you now. Yeah. And you don't, I think back, you were talking about students that achieve things. Yeah. Uh, I ha I've had uh, one major general in the Army. I've had a rear admiral in the Navy. And I think he was with intelligence a lot of the time. Hmm. Uh, Quentin Hayden's daughter has, uh, uh, that I had in school, I had all these kids in school. Uh, had uh, several shows that were on, I believe, CBS mm -hmm. that she had written. Mm. And I've had doctors galore, mm -hmm. lawyers, architects, uh, some entertainers writers but you know I am as proud of those as I can be not that I've had that much influence I don't mean that but uh, I look around and I see students that are in our area right there in Douglas County or Ozark County or where close mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. and see the families they've reared Mm -hmm. the way they've worked, mm -hmm. and I'm just as proud of those mm -hmm. as I am the others. Salt of the earth, kind of. And uh, Max and I taught in a time when people still be uh, believed in their children being good. Mm -hmm. They wanted them to behave. Mm -hmm. And heavens, being from that area myself, all I would have had to have done, if I had trouble with one, was to march down to Max's office and maybe not even telling him, picking up the phone, I could pick up the phone and I could parents. call that parent and say, I've got a problem here. Can you <laughs> shed any light on it? And I'll guarantee you they would have come back a different child the next day. Yeah. But now that was the secret to good discipline. Mm -hmm. To me. Yeah. Well, now there I go work, with work, philosophy. Work, work with the parents. Um, did any students surprise you, you know, in terms of eh, you might not have seen a lot of potential there, and all of a sudden they kind of. Of course. Something happened, and all of a sudden they. That's what I mean, but expecting more out of them yeah. than even they thought yeah. they could give. Yeah. And I can give you a really good example uh, of one. I had this one boy, and uh, he absolutely seemed so timid and so afraid, and it was hard for him to pass a test in world history, mm -hmm. and you just felt sorry for him. And one day that little guy came in, and oh, he was torn up. And I don't know, I may have kept him a little longer after class, but I went to him and I said, what's wrong? He said, they're trying to put me in special ed. Hmm. He said, I don't want to go to special ed. Well. History, world history was a required subject. Mm -hmm. 
And I told him, I said, well, I'll tell you what, you try as hard as you can try, and I'll see to it you don't fail this class. Mm -hmm. But if you don't try, I'll fail you in a twinkle of the eye. Mm -hmm. Well, years went by. This young man is now one of the finest boys. He went to, he's gray haired now, and I'm still saying boy. But he went to work taking care of old people and working with things like Brookside and mm -hmm. those various mm -hmm. caregiver companies. Mm -hmm. And I guess did an outstanding job for them. He now has a wonderful, caring personality. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's even preaching a little bit. Mm. And where it didn't, it sounded like he would be in special ed. He just, you couldn't imagine the change. Mm -hmm. Now he has confidence. Mm -hmm. He's doing a good job with what he's doing. Mm -hmm. It is remarkable mm. the way that boy turned out. Mm. And you know, one day, quite a long time ago, he came to me and uh, he said, you know, Ms. Decker, I'll never forget what you did for me. And he talked about that and it was in the day's work for me. Mm -hmm. But he felt like it changed his life around. Mm -hmm. and. I just loved that boy. Mm -hmm. I liked him back then, but I didn't think he could ever do very much. Mm -hmm. But it, it's really one of the big satisfactions that I have. Mm -hmm. I love my kids. How you touched I laugh, all those lives? And... Uh, I laugh, laugh and say, uh, right now I'm still calling them my kids, and they may be well, there sits Delbert over there. He was right. one of my boys. <laughs> <laughs> Alvy's wife was yeah. one of my girls. Yeah. And I still call them that. Your kids. <laughs> Once in a while, I'll say, do you dislike my calling my kids? And I've never had one that'll tell me they dislike <laughs> it. So when did you retire? 90. I, uh, I wasn't ready. 31 years ago. No, it doesn't seem it. But Max was no longer principal, and I wasn't ready to give it up. I'll have to admit that. And I'll have to admit that I was bored silly with retirement. And it's just been in the last few years that I could tolerate retirement. Mm. Uh, I'm not one of these that could... Yeah. make pottery and right. do this and that, that Kick back. or pull a vacuum cleaner to just pull it over again. It's not right. very challenging. Right. But uh, I felt like I have seen wives stay on in the school system when their husbands retired from administration. Yeah. That is not good for them. Yeah. It's not good for the school. And we'd spent a lifetime in that school and I felt like, and Max did too, that when he quit, I'd better quit too and yeah. get out of the way and yeah. let the new people right. have it. And I don't think I'm wrong in that. Yeah. But I hated the retirement. I did a little yeah. college teaching after that, but I've never cared about college teaching. It was all right. Yeah. But with them, uh, particularly when you're just, uh, and now I'm going to it emphasize the junk when I pronounce adjunct <laughs> professors. Adjunct. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I told you I was a character. Where, where were you teaching? Did uh, I, ask where I you taught for Drury. Drury, okay. Uh, see, Max was under contract with Drury, but he had a different type of contract than I had. Yeah, you were an adjunct. <laughs> I suppose he was part of the time, but then he got to be under a totally different contract. 
uh, Dr. Jelenic offered him a job to teach on the regular staff at, at uh, Drury Long before he ever got his doctorate, and we turned it down to keep her child in Ava. Mm -hmm. And uh, both of us had the opportunity to get into the Springfield system, but we chose not to. Yeah. And financially, probably professionally, we might have been better off, but I better have no pay, regrets. Be, better pay in Springfield. Uh, most I of have them. no regrets. Yeah. But it's uh, with, with the college students, you have them maybe once or twice a week, mm -hmm. and you don't have any chance if they need to get their lives turned around, you don't yeah. have any chance to yeah. try to help to bring them around. Yeah. And it just didn't appeal to me it's that much. It's a time of independence for most young mm -hmm. people. Going and, to college. Uh, Nobody's going to tell them what to do. And uh, I like the content, but I taught one class. Uh, I've forgotten who the Drury super supervisor was at that time. I'm stuttering half the time here. But uh, he couldn't get anyone to teach a course on the Civil War. Mm. And it was an upper level class. And he kept after me to come over and teach it. Well, uh, my main field in history was ancient history, medieval history, mm -hmm. and early modern. Mm -hmm. I liked those periods particularly mm -hmm. well. And I liked the Civil War, but I didn't feel like that was the one I should be teaching. Uh -huh. Well, he kept on, he couldn't get anybody. And uh, they, some of the kids needed it. And I felt like I, I was just sitting at home and letting my mind vegetate. So I finally decided that I'd take it and teach it, mm -hmm. and I did. Mm -hmm. But my stars, even then there was over 50,000 volumes of books on the Civil War, and heaven <laughs> only knows how many hundreds it's a, of magazines. It's a small publishing industry until itself. And do you know that guy had the nerve, this shouldn't go down, but I'm going to say it anyway. He had the nerve to tell me I had that Ken and Burns series. If I just teach it, I could use a lot of the King, Ken Burns oh. uh, tapes yeah. to use in the class. You don't use media when it doesn't have a purpose. Mm -hmm. Now again, there I come through very strong-minded. Mm -hmm. And needless to say, the only Ken Burns thing in that series I made was when I thought it would be a contribution to what we were studying. Yeah. Did you ever, when you were teaching the Civil War, I mean, you know, the Civil War was a terrible time in Horrible. southern Missouri. Yes. I mean, it was brutal. It was brutal everywhere. Yeah. But particularly in Missouri, with the Jayhawkers and the yeah. Bushwhackers. Right. Uh, Max had a great-grandfather that was killed by the Bushwhackers, mm. and they don't even know for sure where he was buried. They mm. think it's down around Bakersfield somewhere. Mm. And his great-grandfather, uh, there was one of the boys that was taken with the great-grandfather and his grandfather then was a little boy and they left him in the field mm. and uh, I, don't, I don't remember what he said happened to the other boy he might have gotten loose but they carried that one away and killed him the great-grandfather <laughs> but you know in those days they might come through, and even if you didn't have union lead leanings, they'd make you join the other army right. 
whether you wanted to or not, or they'd right. kill you. Right. It was a horrible period of time. Yeah. Uh, we should wrap up. I kind of. I don't know if there's a. You may have to take a lot of that out, Tom. <laughs> We've been going an hour, believe it oh, or not. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, one, one final question. So, I've lived down here. This is my 10th year living down here in the beautiful Ozarks. Love it. Uh, when Max was alive, I'd often see you and him at places like Old Field. Went there every Saturday night. Yeah. You, you kind of moved around listening to music. You were often we here every Monday night. You'd be here. Becky said we were going somewhere every night, but she yeah. couldn't keep up with us. You just like to go listen to music. Max, you know, wrote a book on folklore. Yeah. And uh, this this came out of his independent study uh, on his specialist at Peabody. And he came to dearly love the music because it fits right along with the old folklore culture. Uh-huh. And uh, he was, uh, he got sick. I yes, think I told you when we were talking about his book and when you got it. Uh, he didn't like the way they portrayed uh, the Ozarkian. And I am uh, kind of independent on that. I know they're saying Ozarkers more, but I like the word Ozarkian yes. better, and uh -huh. I use it. Uh -huh. But uh, he just came to love and wanting so much that this kind of music, which is such an important part of our heritage, he wanted that preserved. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he got to where he wasn't tied up on Monday night teaching college classes, we scarcely ever missed a night down here. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, then uh, we would go down to the Jackson Jamboree on Friday night, Old Field Opry on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. We used to go to Gainesville on Tuesday nights mm -hmm. when they had music. Uh -huh. And he dearly loved it. And even after he had some vascular dementia, he still loved the music. Mm -hmm. And he loved to play pitch down I here was going to say <laughs> And, he loved to play pitch. And there was more of Max's mind left than people could tell mm -hmm. because he couldn't hear. Mm -hmm. But he was very, very interested in keeping it all going. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've all been so good to us. And, uh, of course, we've been friends with Gordon and Mona McCann for years. Mm -hmm. And in that book, he wrote down amateur folklorist, and that's what Gordon had told him to call him <laughs> years ago. And both of us hated it, that it was in that book like that, because Gordon McCann has done more for preservation of this type of music than anyone I know. Yep. Yep. He's done a lot. And, uh, and he didn't have to do it. I mean, oh, he, no. He had his own business to run. They're wonderful people. I miss Mona. Well, that's good. And I appreciate it. Well, you got more than you bargained for, that's didn't right. you? <laughs> Thank you very much. We've been speaking with Mona Decker about her life. <laughs>